Last year, 657 billion photographs were posted on the internet. Here's another way to think about that. Every two minutes, more photographs are created in the world that we have today than, that, than were ever existing 150 years ago. Online, on billboards, and in magazines, we see thousands of images as we go about our daily life. But I always question, what do these images actually mean? What are they trying to tell us? And what can I learn from these? As a photographer of people, I choose to illuminate the people and places that the world knows very little about. The people I photograph do not have billboards and they don't have magazines. Very few have access to the internet, but all have remarkable lives. Many have suffered unthinkable atrocities and all have retained their dignity. What drives me is the knowledge that if I don't go there with my camera, then to the world, these people do not exist. And if they don't exist, then how do we have a chance to feel something and to connect? Why is this important? Well, some stories just simply must be told. And with visual storytelling, we can help people to feel and to care, and maybe even to act. Here is one story. It is the story of the Nyaragusu refugee camp in Western Tanzania. It opened 20 years ago, and it houses 150,000 refugees from the Democratic Republic of Congo and from Burundi. 80% are women and children. Outside visitors here are very rare, except for the occasional delegation from a donor country or humanitarian leader. But one could say, this is a forgotten place. And as a result, donor funding is at an all-time low. I wanted to show how the people here continue on nevertheless and to reveal their humanity. What do you see? I see a man whose body shows the hard physical labor he's done his whole life. And I see a father with his daughter. When I met Kaluta Mwangaza, he was building a mud, a mud protection around his temporary shelter after thieves had slashed his tent and stole everything, a second setback after he had lost everything when he fled his country. He lives in this shelter with his wife, Apendeki, baby Manuela, and this is three-year-old little Honorina. This moment will stay with me forever. Such humility and resilience blew me away. 12-year-old Nima, she's also from the Congo. When I photographed her, she was standing in a field recently planted of maize in the temporary shelter zone in Yorugusu. Temporary shelter zone, doesn't that mean a short time? She's been here for over a year. She told me that her home was attacked and her and her family had to run for their lives. It takes a lot for a photographer to get this close. But this girl let me in immediately. The trust was profound. I don't know what she's thinking in this photograph, but I know she's full of resolve. I was struck by the faces of these Congolese refugee students in the camp. 91 of them are in this classroom. And then this tiny little man comes in with a small backpack, and I couldn't believe that this was minor, their, their math teacher. And at 23, he was, he was full of determination to give these children a future. This is Sifa Primary School in Yorugusu, and it has 2,300 students, and they've not seen a drop of donor funding. The teachers have around 100 students per class. The classrooms are falling down. Many have no roof. And when it's windy, the students can't hear the, the teachers talk. The only time the students do not come to class is when it's raining, 
and that's because the class is actually closed. And still, they show hope. This is a little Burundi boy that I met miles outside of the camp. It's daily life for some children to go and collect firewood. And because they have to walk three, four, five, sometimes six hours, and this guy has no shoes, they have to miss school. It's not uncommon for the local community to beat up the refugees because they think that they're taking their firewood. But this boy has taken on the task given to him by his family with incredible resolve. And I was monumentally impressed with him. This is a Congolese asylum seeker family outside their newly built refugee shelter. They walked for two weeks to get here and they've been here for a year. The father is Luca Faliala, and these are three of his four sons. They are all blind. For some unknown reason, just before leaving Congo, they lost their sight. Their mother is 26 years old, her name is Mahombi, and the other son, who's nine, they're not blind. And these two now are the eyes and the hope for this family. 14-year-old Diello listens to the teacher before he writes on the blackboard at Furaha Primary School in neighboring Nduta camp. The students study under the trees in groups and there are no classrooms. There are no textbooks. There are no notebooks. Food is lacking. And latrines is one to 128 instead of the recommended one to 25. And yet still, despite only being paid $22 a month, the teachers put in double shifts, morning and afternoon, not to mention the marking and the preparation for the day, for the next day. Life in camp is hard, but still, families find joy in the birth of children. This is 30 seconds old, baby Marion. I was privileged enough to be allowed into the main camp clinic. She was born to Congolese refugee Tosha, who's 29, and she comes from a place in DRC called Baraka. But finding no peace to go back to, Tosha has made Nyorugusu her home. And this is her fifth child in the main camp clinic. And here in the clinic, they have 10 babies being born every day. Documenting stories of survival is not just a job for me. It's heavily emotional. As much as I try, I find it hard not to get caught up in the struggles of the people that I photographed, and I often feel helpless. And when I think of the enormity of this problem that we face all around the world, I feel hopeless. I think this is what the world is feeling too. That is why I make a point of focusing not only on the tragedy, but on the healing and on the hope. So why do I focus my lens on refugees? What is it that I can do to help them? The number of people displaced all around the world is greater than ever before. Global crises compete for our attention. It bothers me when refugees are reduced to figures. It strips them of their humanity. And in the face of donor fatigue and geopolitical disinterest, Seriously, how can my images make a difference? I was thinking about this a lot when I photographed the images of the refugees that I just showed you at Nyarugusu. These are human beings that need our compassion. Nowhere have more people been forced to flee than from the DRC. Imagine, it's 5,500 people per day. And this population is totally forgotten. Humanitarian aid is scarce. I just hope by sharing my images, even just a little bit, that I can lift the lid of invisibility. All these people need is a little bit of help so that they can restart their lives. Throughout my career, I have had the opportunity to photograph many inspiring stories, but there's one that continues to blow me away. It's the story 
of a group of women who decided to take it upon themselves to make the changes that they needed. They were tired of forced marriage, sexual violence, and female genital mutilation. They created a sanctuary for themselves where no men are allowed. This is the story of the Omoja Women's Village in Northern Kenya. It was started by a woman called Rebecca Lola Soli in 1990. And the women there have created systems where they keep safe, they can earn a living, and they maintain their emancipation in a village without men. So although it's Samburu culture, 11-year-old Mamusi was forced to marry a 57-year-old man by her father. She ran away after one day of marriage. And she came to Omoja. And she has now become a role model, a spokesperson, and the official greeter for the village. Mary Lokideng bathes in the Wasa River that runs nearby the village at dawn. Every day, she comes here to collect water for cooking and cleaning. It's hard work, she told me. But when I come here in the morning, it's beautiful. The water is cool. And here, I really, really do feel that I'm free. Nokochum, she's from Takana, not from Samburu. And this lady, I will remember for always. She never stops smiling. Every day I wake up and I'm happy, she said. Jane Longipe is one of the beaders in Omoja. Jane puts on her traditional jewelry every morning, and the women at Omoja maintain that the children continue on learning the tradition of Samburu beading. It's not just a way of life and of beautifying yourself. Through the sales of these beautiful designs to visitors, these women are able to earn a living and this is something that in traditional Samburu culture, women are not allowed to do. For a village of only women, there are a lot of children. So when I asked Mamusi about this, she just winked at me and she said, just because we are not allowed to have men in this village doesn't mean that we don't pay our friends a visit outside. <laughs> Since my visit to Amarja in 2015, many international media outlets have requested to publish and republish this story, often surrounding important international global events like Women's Day. But what of the refugees from the forgotten Yurigusu camp? I believe here too, my images can be used as a tool to help build compassion for people few knew existed and who need our help. These are stories of people who have lost everything, who have fled their homes, and some who have fled violence. Haven't we heard these stories before? What is different about the way these stories have been told? A mindset shift is all that makes the difference. And the way to shift a mindset from indifferent to compassion is by showing there is hope. Hope stirs curiosity. When we have curiosity, we have interest. And with interest, instead of doom and gloom, we have the opportunity to imagine solutions, to get people to say instead of, oh, that's too bad, we have them say, what can I do? What worries me is when the spotlight gets turned off. That is why I will continue to keep a spotlight on stories that need to be told. Thank you.